السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نحمد الله ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters in Islam Welcome to our first episode of our series The Saviors of Islam Where we will be going into and diving into 10 great individuals and personalities In the history of Islam That left a mark and a legacy all throughout the world Today we will start with one of the legends of Islam One of the, the heroes of our past and our history A man that perhaps was not known for his, great, for his great understanding of Islamic law and jurisprudence. A man that was not revered or today is not revered and honored due to his knowledge of hadith and tafsir. But rather he was a man. He was a child, an individual that lived a life of complete luxury. A life of, of complete glitter and glamour. And this is none other than the great Umar Abdul Abdullah Aziz rahimahullah ta'ala. دع الأيام تفعل ما تشاء وطب نفسا إذا حكم القضاء ولا تجزع لحادثة الليالي فما لحوادث الدنيا بقى A man as a child, as a child, born with a golden spoon in his mouth as a child, everything that he dreamed of and everything that he wanted and desired was put on his table, was given to him without asking, without, without continuous seeking. Allah gave all the luxuries and the wealth of the world to him. Why wouldn't he have the luxuries of the world while he was born in the palace of the governor of Misr, Abdul Aziz Rahimullah, his father? Why would he not have the luxuries of the world while his family was the Umayyah family, the governors and the kings of the world? This was that child the golden boy of the family, the noble boy of the clan. He was Umar Abdul Aziz rahimahullah ta'ala. As a child, people would know him. Before becoming Khalifa, he was known as that man, a man of arrogance, a man of, a man of, of, of excessive usage of wealth and luxury. When people would look at him, just by seeing his face, how Hassan ibn Salih would say, Kuntu a'rifu al-khayr fi wajhihi, that I would be able to tell the unbelievable amount of bounties and blessings that Allah has given this man just by looking at him. Just by looking at his face and his body and his clothes. We would be able to tell that indeed this man is blessed. Before Khilafah he was a man. He was an individual. When he was reprimanded, he had great, he had great fear in, in the hearts of people. Once a man came to him and he said to him while he was in Mecca that your pants are dragging below your ankles and they're sweeping the floor. So pull up your pants a little bit. So Umar Abdul Aziz Rahimullah looked back at him and said to him, Oh man, watch what you say. Watch what you say. If you dare say that to me again, I will cut your neck off. Such a man. Abdul Kathir Rahimullah says that we do not know. We do not know of anyone that has inherited more wealth from their father than Umar Abdul Aziz Rahimullah and his fellow brothers. What a wealthy child he was. That the perfume that he would wear, with the perfume which was custom made for him, when he would walk through the streets of Medina, in, the, in his mist and behind him, a, 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 a beautiful fragrance would remain, so people would know that yes, Umar has walked this area. He had a special walk, a walk of arrogance, a walk of pride. You know, they would call it the Mashiach of Umar. The walk of Umar, rahimahullah, people would try to, to emulate his walk. This is who he was before becoming a Khalifa. Then a time came, my dear brothers and sisters, a time came when the announcement was made that the next Khalifa after the passing of Sulaiman is Umar Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah ta'ala. This time came where his life changed. We today do not revere this man. We today do not hold this man at a high status because of the first 36 years of his life. We don't, we, don't, we don't talk about his first 36 years as a great man. But rather just two years and five months of his life was enough for him to leave such a strong mark on the world. To carve his legacy within the countries of the world. To carve a legacy within the hearts of the Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Just two years and five months. When he becomes a Khalifa, and he's given the responsibility of the governorship of the world, at a time and in an era where oppression was synonymous with kings, at a time and an age 
where, where cheating and lying and, and drinking and sinning was habitual and it was a ritual for the kings of the Umayyah Khilafah where people would take them, where they would take the money of the people without the right, where they would, where they would kill people and slaughter them just based upon how they spoke to them and how they looked at them. This is the era that he came in. But we see the effect that he left in the world. The million dollar question is, how does such a man who lived his entire life in glitter and glamour, in luxuries and wealth, make, sudden, make a, sudden, a sudden change in his life that the world today is still in awe and reverence of him? What did he do? My dear brothers and sisters, there were two fundamental qualities and two primary characteristics that he brought into his life that made him the man that we know today. That made him the personality that we, that we keep at a high status today. And number one, the first quality that he brought into his life was the quality of sacrifice. The quality of letting go. The quality of making sure that he will do what he says before other people are expected to do the same. He would become the change that he wanted to see in others. The quality of understanding that Iman, the quality of understanding that being a Muslim comes with trials and hardships. Alif Laam Mim, Ahasib al Nasu, and Yutraku and Yakulu, Amanna, Wahum La Yuftanun. Do people of Iman think, do Muslims and believers think that they can just say they're Muslims and believers and they will not be tested? Allah says, We tested people that came before them. And indeed we will test him. He understood that sacrifice has to start with him and his own family. And now this man living a life of, of absolute poverty. One day he goes to his wife Fatima, the, the, the most royal and noble woman in the history of political Islam. He comes to her and he says to her, the daughter of Abdul Malik, the previous king. And he asks her, do you have a few dinars? Do you have two dinars? Two bucks. She asked for what? He says, I want to buy some grapes. My stomach has not tasted the sweetness of grapes ever since I became a Khalifa. I, I would desire to eat some grapes. The wife says, Amir al Mu'minin, I do not have two dinars to give you. The, the, the Malik, the governor from the east to the west and the south and the north. The governor of the Muslims at large, where, his, where his, his governorship reached Spain on one side and China on the other side. Such a man. And he's asking his wife for two dinars. And his wife says to him, I don't have two dinars. Then he asks her, do you just have a few nickels and dimes? Maybe I can collect them and buy a few grapes. The wife says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, O leader of the Muslims. Your kingdom reaches China and Spain and you don't have a few nickels and dimes to buy yourself some grapes? And he looks back at his wife and he says that I am not ready, I am not ready to buy my Jahannam for a few grapes of the world. This is who he became through his sacrifice for himself and his family. He wanted to see change in the world so he started with himself. He initiated that process in his own family. His wife had, Ibn Kathir rahimullah says, that the amount of gold that was given to the wife of Umar Abdul Aziz by her, by, her, by her father, we do not know of anyone that was given such gold on the day of their marriage. Umar Abdul Aziz comes to her when he becomes a Khalifa and he says to her, Oh my beloved wife, there were times that we, we lived a life of continuous happiness and luxury. Now I have decided that I will live a life of hardship. Now I have decided that I will live a life that in, in which I will prefer the rights of others over myself. If you choose to do the same, you can remain with me. But if you choose to, to live your own life and continue to live in luxury, then I will have to depart from you. She says, of course I choose you. Then he says to her that all the gold that your father has given you, you must give it back to Baytul Mal and give it back to charity. If you do that, then I will stay with you. She says to him, what a strong woman she was. She says to him, Oh my beloved husband, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Oh leader of the Muslims, If I was given the gold, the amount of the mountains of Mecca and Medina, and if you were to ask me, which one I prefer, the companionship of you, or the wealth of mine, it would not be a question. 
These were people who would let the world go to earn the happiness of their creator. They would let the, the luxuries of the, and the wealth of the world go so they can see that the Prophet on the Day of Judgment is smiling back at them. They were sacrifice that started from himself and his family. It's easy. It's easy to sacrifice for yourself. But it becomes difficult for a father to see his children sacrificing also. One day he comes home before the day of Eid. And, the, and Fatima says to him, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the day of Eid is coming up. And all the children of the city, all the cousins of the city and relatives will come to your house. You are the governor and they will sit with your family and your children. But your children have no clothes to wear. They're wearing the old shabby clothes they've been wearing for many days. They have nothing. Do you not have any money to buy them some clothes? And he replies and says, no, there's nothing that I have. The wife continues to say, like, you know what? Why don't you ask for an extra month of allowance from your, from your treasurer and we will pay him back next month. So upon hearing this request from his wife, he goes to Mazahim, the treasurer, and he says to him, can you give me an extra month of an allowance so I can buy my children some clothes to wear for Eid? My dear brothers and sisters, the people that have the least wealth in this world, even them, even them, even those individuals require and desire on the day of Eid that they also wear nice clothes. Mazahim says, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, can you confirm this fact for me that you will be living for one more month so you earn this wealth? Can you guarantee for me that you will be living in this world for one more month, hence becoming the owner of this wealth? Upon hearing this, he walked back to his wife empty-handed, head bowed down, and he said to his wife that I can't do it. I can't. I can't take the money that I am not rightful towards. So the day of Eid comes and the children of the governor of the Muslims, the, the Malik, the king of the, of the West and the East, they come to their house and the children are wearing old clothes, ripped up, patched up clothes. And when the family leaves, Amir al-Mu'mineen comes to his children like a man. And he, and he looks at his children and tears start rolling down his eyes because no father wants to see no father wants to see his child in pain. No father wants to see his child being embarrassed in front of others. He looks at his children with, with pain in his eyes and he says to them, Oh my children, please forgive me that today I embarrassed you in front of your relatives and your cousins. So Abdul Malik, one of the older children of Amir al-Mu'mineen, looks at him and says to him, Oh father, don't you ever say that. Don't you ever say that. You best believe that today was the happiest day of our life. Never in our life were we able to hold our head up higher with more pride and with more honor than today. The father says, why is that? He says, oh father, because today we let the world know that our father, our father, Amir al-Mu'mineen, will never take a nickel or a dime from the mal and the money of the Muslims. They will never take a dime or a nickel that he is not rightful towards. He will always prefer the rights of others over himself. And our father has not given us or fed us with a, with a penny of haram money. And everything in our life is halal. He wanted to go for a hajj. He wanted to go for a hajj. As Amir al-Mu'mineen, you are allowed to take the money of Baytul Mal to go for a hajj. He did not have enough money to go for a hajj. Amir al-Mu'mineen, sacrifice starts from yourself. Sacrifice starts from your family. Sacrifice starts from your own children. And then the world will change. And then the world around us will revolve around our fingers. When we become... When we become subservient to the orders of Allah, we will see that the world will become subservient to our desires. He understood this and he sacrificed his self, his desires, his family's desires to earn the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what was the effect of this? What was the effect of this? And this leads us to the second quality that, that, was, that was famous with him and that was dominant within him and that was the quality of justice. That was the quality of Adil within the lands of the Muslims. We, we see that initially this quality was, was a branch of the trunk of the quality of sacrifice that he brought into his own life first. And then justice spread around the world. If we want to see change within our families and our friends and our communities, let's look within ourselves and ask ourselves, anfusikum afala Let's ask ourselves, where can I get better? Where can I progress? Where can I move higher in the ranks of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then justice will spread in the world. Today also there's oppression in the world. Today also there are kids being slaughtered and killed all across the world. And we look, and we look at those videos and those pictures and our hearts have become desensitized because we've been shown it so much. And not a drop of tear falls from our eyes. 
And not a habit changed within, not a habit changes, not a habit changes in our life. So this oppression that we see are across the world. Change will take place only when I decide that I can initially do something within my own life. And we see when he brought change in his life and sacrifice in his life, that there was not a person, there was not a person within a thousand miles radius that was ready to accept zakat because everyone had enough money. Everyone had nisab. There was not a person to accept zakat. A time of adl, when the governor and the king of the Byzantine Empire had, had taken us, has taken a prisoner, a Muslim prisoner, and he started torturing him. And he said to him, Man, man yansuruka yawman. Who's going to help you today? Who's, who's there to help you? The slave looked back at him and said, Today, my leader will help me. And the governor laughed at his face when Umid al-Mu'minin heard about this. When this news reached his ears, my brothers and sisters, he wrote a letter to the king of the Byzantine Empire and he said to them, Oh man, you listen, you listen. If you do not release this prisoner, I will bring an army towards you that the world has never witnessed. That army will be such that the front line will be at the gates of your empire and the last line will be at my palace, in my house. You prepare yourself for such a battle. A few days later, he let that slave go. This was justice in the world that was revolving because there was change within the man's heart. There was sacrifice within the man's family, within his own family. My dear brothers and sisters, these are a few qualities that we can also bring into our lives and emulate those qualities that he brought into his life. The quality of sacrifice. The quality of understanding man ahabba dunyahu adharra bi akhiratihi wa man ahabba akhiratahu adharra bi dunyahu fa'athiru ma yabqa ala ma yifna the, uh, the quality of understanding that whoever loves his dunya too much he will at, at the end of the day when the death settles he will definitely harm his akhirah and whoever loves his akhirah at a level at, a, at, a, at, a, at the level of uh, at the peak of it he will at the end of the day may, he may harm his dunya so the prophet says give preference to that which remains over that which will soon perish. كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ It will all soon perish. Give preference to the Akhirah. So we as Muslims, young Muslims, older Muslims all across the world, we have to realize that this is a hero of, our, of, of Islam. He is a legend of Islam, but he is not a legend based upon his entire life. He is a legend just from 900, less than 900 days of his life. He brought change within the world. Less than a thousand days of his life, a change that was brought, a revolution was brought all across the world. There was no governor oppressing. There was no governor stealing. There was no man ready to harm another man without the right of doing so. There was no oppression happening at that time. How did this happen? Because there were people like Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah that, that were grown and that were born. And a, and a, a burning desire was born in their heart in which, in which they realized that change across the world will happen when I can understand قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Only that person can bring change who has rectified himself, who has brought change within himself, and then justice will prevail around the world. So the oppression that we see, it's an effect of our own deeds. The oppression that we see, it's an effect of our own a'mal. If we change our a'mal, تُؤْتِي أُكُلَهَا كُلَّ حِينٍ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهَا We see the effects of our deeds, we change our a'mal, we change our habits, and we will soon see that just like, that Allah still remains, that Allah hasn't gone. وَلَن تَجِي لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِكَافٍ عَبْدًا That Allah still remains, and He is still around, and He will remain, and He will continuously be there. So if we bring that same quality into our life, that Allah will bring the same change in the world. The quality of sacrificing our desires, sacrificing our lust, sacrificing those evil thoughts, and those evil glances, and those evil noises in our ears, and those, e and the, and those talks of evil, and gossip, and backbiting. If we sacrifice those things and turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, indeed change will come. And all of this, the quality of justice, the quality of sacrifice, was fueled by His quality of piety by his quality of ibadah in, the, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where Fatima, the last story I will say, where Fatima, the wife of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, Abdul Aziz rahimahullah, she would say, when my husband will stand up at night for tahajjud, I will look at him from the corner of my eye, and I will start making dua, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, just make sure that my husband does not read this one verse, a part of a verse in Surah Al-Shura, just make sure my husband does not read this one verse, because if he reads this one verse, 
he cries and sobs until he falls unconscious. Ya Allah, please make sure he does not read this one verse. What was that verse? That verse was, Fariqun fil Jannah wa Fariqun fil Sahir. There are two categories of Muslims. One category that will go to Jannah with the Prophets and the Sahabas and our pious predecessors. And there will be a group of people that will end up having to serve some time in the fire of Jahannam. And when he would read this ayah, he will fall unconscious out of fear of the fire of Jahannam. There was piety inside of his heart. There was taqwa and God consciousness. And this brought change, sacrifice within himself and his family and justice that prevailed all across the world. When we read the Quran, we have to feel it. When you pray salah, we should try our best to feel it. And last but not least, let's not worry about the world. Let's worry about ourselves, how we can become better Muslims. And not only for ourselves, but for the entire world. We are not a selfish ummah. We are a selfless ummah. I am not a selfish person. I am a selfless person. I care as much about my brother praying as much as I care about myself praying. But this happens together. We can't be individuals that lock ourselves inside of a cave or a fortress just worrying about ourselves and not about anyone else. Nor can we become those people that always point fingers at others and don't worry about themselves. Umar ibn al-Aziz was the, the greatest combination of both qualities where he worried about himself and the sacrifice within his own life and also made sure that no one else in his ummah and his kingdom was falling short of that standard. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me the tawfiq and all of you the ability to bring change within our own lives. This motivate, this life and the lives of these 10 people that we will speak about have to serve as a motivation for us and have to serve as a stepping stone for us towards the right direction and to bring the right and to bring and inculcate the right qualities into our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me the ability to act upon this and all of you beautiful brothers and sisters the, the ability and tawfiq to bring these qualities into your own lives. Jazakallah khair for listening. Wa akhu da'wan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.